was like a, a fork in the road moment. I was like, I can continue doing this mm-hmm. and not necessarily be happy, or I can take a risk and sell the business and focus on my trading and potentially do something else. I didn't know at the time I wanted to become a mentor. Nice. It's great to connect. Thank you for thank you for being here to share your experience. Um, I'm really excited to have you on the Life is Bullish podcast and share your experience, share all the things that all the you know all the things that you've been through, all the things that you have to share also on your trading journey. I wanted to start, of course, from trading. How did you actually start trading, and how did you approach the the market? So for me, I knew nothing about it at the start. And then I just came across something probably on YouTube, like an ad or something. And then there was um, there was like this in-person seminar. I'm in the UK, so it was in Birmingham. And it was like a three-hour seminar. There was, I think there was about 25, 30 people there. Mm-hmm. Probably 95% of us didn't know anything about what trading was. But it was a case of... There was a projector at the front. There was a couple of guys that were working as a an education firm. And they were like, this is what essentially trading can give. Were, it was more about selling the lifestyle rather than actually oh. teaching or a strategy. And I think that's how they were operating at the time. Um, so yeah, it was a case of there's a table at the back of the room. If anyone wants to actually learn and actually change their lives and, and to be able to have a house like this and a car like that. Yeah. then um, you know what to do. And I was like, well, okay, it seems like a good deal. So it was a case of I signed up for a 12-month course that was based in London. They did some online stuff as well, but I'm talking like eight years ago. So there was nothing like Zoom or live calls or Discord wasn't even invented back then, I don't think. <laughs> so the the amount of online support that they gave wasn't really there. So I I had like a 12 month access to drive down to London, but I'm like three and a half hours drive or two, three hours on the train. So I probably went down about five times over the space of a year. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of getting some value, but for the five figures that I spent on that course, uh, which was only there for a 12 month period, I wouldn't say I really got value for money from it, but that's where I started. So I don't regret taking that leap of faith and going to that seminar in the first place, or even putting that money down and, and paying for that 12 month course in London, because that's what, that was part of my journey. Right. And I've yeah. had education from other companies and individuals in the seven years between then and now, uh, which has led me to be where I am now. So yeah, that's, that's really where I started. Um, so I can laugh at it now saying that the first educator I came across was by far the most expensive and by far gave me the the least value possible, mm-hmm. but it's what started the journey, right? Yeah, of course. At least you know you approached trading, like they made you find out and get and get started. So yeah, yeah. Touching on that, um, how did you proceed after that? So you had that experience; it was really expensive compared to the value that you got. After that, how did your training journey actually evolve? So for me, it took me quite a while, and maybe it's because I'm a slow learner. Um, I could admit that. And also because I was running a fitness business at the time, Hmm. which I only just sold last year. Um, yeah. And I've got four children. So over the last eight years I've had, well, another two, my last two children were born. So when you're managing a business that's open 17 hours a day and pretty much operates 20 odd hours a day, you know, with social media and emails coming in. And, and it was a seven day a week business and then having children as well, it can be very difficult to then find the time to learn and, and back test and live trade. But so I was only really dedicating maybe an hour, sometimes two hours a day, very early in the morning, maybe a small amount during the day if I wasn't in meetings or with children. And then I was mm-hmm. doing things like back testing late in the evening. So, but I did that consistently for six five or six years until i became a a consistent trader so i I think honestly think it takes like three to five years for anyone to find consistency in trading anyway i don't know what you think but i'm yet to meet a trader that's consistently profitable that hasn't been through at least a four or five year journey to get to that point because it's even if you eliminated all the external factors like you just at home rent free living at your mum's back bedroom 
you didn't have any children, no responsibilities, and you had 16 hours a day to learn how to trade, I think it would still take you three to five years because you've got to go through certain educators and you've got to go through one strategy. No, that doesn't work for me. Another strategy. Right. No, I don't really like that. Another strategy. And then you've got the psychological element as well that it's completely different to running a normal business or going and working because there's no guarantee that you're being paid at the end of the month. You're yeah. not being paid an hourly rate. You could go a month and actually give money back to the markets. And then two or three months later, you make you make more money than your mum and dad did for the whole year. Yeah, right. It's a completely different mindset shift to anything you were ever taught in school or from your parents. And that takes time, doesn't it? So then when you're adding in external factors like, okay, you do work a nine to five job or you're working late nights in a warehouse or you're owning a business, you're building a family, you're looking after your children, then obviously that just prolongs that process. It makes it a little bit longer. But in terms of like perspective and time scale, even five years is nothing. That's like a university degree, right? I've mentioned it before that if you wanted to become a doctor, was it going to take like six, seven years to be yeah, qualified right. as a doctor? Exactly. And then even then, one, you've got no guarantee you're going to get a job. Two, you're not going to guarantee you're going to enjoy it and you might go and do something else anyway. Um, and three, that process of learning, you're compiling much more debt from university fees than you would five to seven years learning from a, a Forex mentor. Right. So like in terms of perspective, if anyone's worried that it's going to take them five years, if they just started like five years is nothing. It goes super fast. Um, like if someone's 19, 20 years old that wants to get into trade and they're like, oh, it's going to take me five years. Well, yeah, you're only going to be 25. Yeah, true. <laughs> That's nothing. Like I'm 37 right now and I still feel like I've got the whole life ahead of me. And I feel like I'm like every week is like a fresh slate. I feel like I'm starting mm. again because I've got that perspective that I've got so much time ahead of me. And I have conversations with people that are 18, 19 years old and they feel like they should already have it figured out by now. I'm like, no, you just need to take your time and, and know that you're you're young as hell and you've got so much time to be able to experience certain things and, and just don't rush it. And if it takes you 10 years, you still will be only 29 years old. Yeah. And you'd be a, an extremely consistent and profitable trader with possibly other things, investments in the background at the same time. 100%. Yeah, totally agree. It's a process, you know, like people should not take it slow, of course, always try to make it as fast as possible. But at the same time, keep in mind that it takes time. Like it's a skill that requires time and effort and years of refining in order to find consistency. Talking yeah. about consistency, which is actually the hardest challenge that you needed to, you know, to face in order to become a profitable trader or or to advance in trading. Yeah, it is. It's hard to be consistent because not only is it about being consistent in your actions in the charts, like mm -hmm. making sure that you're following your trade plan. First of all, it's difficult to do that while you're still finding and building your trade plan. That's why I mentioned it's very normal to go from one mentorship program yeah. to another mentorship program and then another one because you've got to try certain things to realize whether it resonates with you, whether you like it or not. Right. And some people are really incredible traders, but they're just not very good educators. Uh, and that's not knocking them. It's just that they might literally be amazing at trading themselves, but if they can't verbally or visually teach what they do to someone else it can be very hard for other people to learn from them so and i've True. experienced that before i've you know followed certain incredible traders and i just didn't really understand their perspective and it's just one of those things it's a part of the journey again or maybe it's a case of like let's say for example someone works nine to five or they have a busy lifestyle for whatever reason they have a business they have a family and then they're trying to learn a strategy from someone that has all the time of the world and they're staring at the charts for eight hours a day. Is that really going to work? Like you have two different lifestyles. One person has all the time in the world and the other person's struggling for 30 minutes a day. So those strategies don't really sync. So you have to find a strategy that works for your lifestyle and your personality. Someone might, mm -hmm. someone might be really patient and want to swing trade and like hold for weeks. Yeah. Other people might want to be in and out in less than an hour. Right. So, Again, that's why the journey, I think, takes so long because you've got to find who you are as a person 
You've got to find a strategy that actually works. You've got to resonate with the coach, the person that's teaching that strategy in order to actually take that in. And then you've got to find a, a way of trading that actually fits in with your lifestyle, which is one of the reasons why very recently, uh, me, Tom and Callum at Evolution Markets, we've switched to a higher time frame because we did loads of surveys and, and polls with our mm. students and people on Instagram saying, do you work a nine to five or can you stare at the charts for like six hours a day? And also if you had the ability to stare at the charts for six hours a day, would you want to do that? Yes or no. And the overwhelming majority of people are like, yes, I work full time. No, I don't want to stare at the charts all day. I've probably got maybe 30 minutes to an hour a day to actually mm. look for trades. And I don't want to do any more than that. I'd rather earn a bit of money and have freedom. And I want to have a, a higher strike rate and reduce my emotions. So things like coming away from the lower time frame for a lot of people has been super beneficial with not only their trading results, because if you're entering off a higher time frame, it's more solid, isn't it? Like the four hours more yeah. powerful than 15 minutes, 15 minutes more powerful than one minute. So it holds more weight. And if we're trading based on things like four hour liquidity pools, it's going to have more of an impact in that directional bias. Plus, like this morning, for, for example, we're sitting on our hands at 8 a.m. UK time. We're waiting for the 10 a.m. four hour candle close for confirmation. When that candle closes at 10 a.m., which it did as an unconfirmed signal, I'm then saying to my students, right, OK, well, we're doing nothing until the 2 p.m. candle closes. Mm -hmm. So we've got so much free time now to do anything else because we know that the signal is not there so we're not even looking at any time frame lower than that four hours. There's no need to. And it does wonders for your patients. There's no anxiety. And it also means that if they're looking after children or they're at work, they can actually go and do that without that fear of missing out and checking their phone. Oh, I'm going to miss this trade. And this person's taking the yeah. short. I should be in that cell too. No, like focus on yourself and make sure that the strategy that you're trading actually works. And you've got to be consistent at that. 100%, 100%. Talking about this, I wanted to ask, what is actually your style of trading? You're, you say you're staying a lot on four hours. Are you more, more swing trading or day trading? What is your approach? Yeah, so I my background, when I first started, I was being taught really about higher time frames. So I was taking trades off the daily and the four hour minimum. And then it's interesting, um, Every, every year that I went through my learning process as a trader, I actually went lower every time, like a lower time frame almost every year. So I started on the daily, mm. then to the four hour, then entries on the one hour, then entries on the 15 minute, all the way down to the five second. Yeah. And Great. okay, yeah, I was learning lots of information and there was periods where I was really consistent and then periods where I really wasn't consistent mm -hmm. to the point where I found a sweet spot around four hour, 15 minute directional bias and one minute entry. And I was doing that consistently for a good 18 to 24 months, right? That's when I opened the mentorship and then fast forward six months, realizing that actually the lower time frame strategy is not really for the masses. It doesn't really help people that work full time. So then we switch back to 15 minute entry and four hour directional bias. So we're literally just using two timeframes mm -hmm. and we're using a couple of indicators and we're taking probably one or two trades a week on average with a strike That's rate good. above 50%. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm happy to go over, I could go over like a trade recap. I could share screen. If yeah, you let's, want to. let's do it. Actually, we've never done it in, yeah, let's in, do that. Um, in a podcast, but I think it's great. Yeah. I have the chance to do it. I, I gave you awesome the screen share. So you should be able to see this on the chart. Yeah, amazing. So I'll go over a trade that I actually took a few weeks ago on, on EU. What I'll do is I'll just bar replay this back. It was only a few weeks ago. So this is the four hour of mapping out for directional bias. And we're using the fractals indicator for defined highs and lows as liquidity pools, because we noticed that you can see highs of candles that don't form a fractal. They don't tend to really hold much weight. And it also makes it more systemized and rule-based, very mechanical. And therefore, when you're looking at the charts, doing your outlook or your analysis that morning or that afternoon, you're like, do we have this yes or no, rather than there being too much discretion. So with this, we're marking out the highs and current price, meaning yeah. this, well, 
it actually moves down to the most recent, meaning this is our current trading range, right? Yeah. If I went further back, this would have been the low until it was taken out. And we're using follow through and momentum. So the fact that we had more than one candle close below this previous four hour low, we're classing this as follow through. So we've got follow through to the downside, meaning we're only looking for sells. So what's that doing? It's removing 50% of the discretion, knowing that we are mm. not interested in buying. So it, if you're removing 50% of the discretion, it's making it 100% easier to trade. Yeah. So if we skip this forwards, and we're using premium versus discount as well. So okay. when we get follow through to the downside, we're basically only looking to sell from premium pricing only. So we're setting alerts and we're waiting for price to come higher, which it does. And it hovers around and, and, and it still kind of stays in that area for a bit. If I move down to the 15 minute, now we can start to see, okay, what indicators do we use to allow us to find entries? So we've still got the fractals in here to look at confirmed highs and lows, liquidity points of the 15 minute. We can see when we zoom out, we've got our four hour range high, our four hour range low. We've got premium versus discount. We know that we've had follow through to the downside. So we're only looking for sells at this stage. We're not looking for buys unless the four hour high gets breached, interacted with, and then yep. we'll reconfirm what happens. So we've got London kill zone and New York kill zone. So we're only looking for liquidity sweeps and entry points that happen within these gray boxes. Anything in between, we don't care what happens. Even Asia, we're just aware of it. It's not a confluence. We just, we're just aware that it's there. So if I fast forward, just so it comes to kind of London open. Which will be soon. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. Even the previous day, if price comes back into premium, which it does, but we do not get a fractal liquidity sweep. It's just one drive up mm -hmm. and then nothing happens, right? When it pushes down, it creates a fractal high, breaks the low. When it comes back, it does not take the high. It just basically mitigates and drops. So there's no entry on the 18th of April. So we're coming back looking at this and we're mapping out our 15 minute range which at the time was the most recent high and the lowest point. So we're contained within a 15 minute range. Mm -hmm. And we want two things to happen for an entry. We either want the range to be taken and we can look for a trade short, or if that doesn't happen and we're still contained within price, we want to look for the most recent 15 minute fractal to be liquidated and it must happen inside a kill zone. So if we fast forward, and we can see what happens here. We're inside London kill zone. We trail back to the most recent fractal. So not any other historical. It has to be the most recent. Mm -hmm. And we can just mark out and say, that's liquidity, liquidity that's been taken. And we are going to place a sell stop order, not market execution, below the candle that has swept. And okay. we're just going to place nice. our stop loss above an area of protection. So we can see there's likely some liquidity above here. We don't want to have a tight stop like this. We want to give it some kind of protection and every single time we are targeting a three to one nice okay all of so the times so you go for one to three restore ratio yeah always nice. full one percent risk no partials no break-evens we're leaving our stop loss where it is for the whole trade and it's either a win or a lose so when we play this forwards it takes us into the trade and then we get a one to three and that was a trade that all three of us coaches took and there must have been like 20 odd plus students that took it as well. Not because it was a signal sent into Discord, because we don't do that. Mm -hmm. But the directional bias and the 15 minute liquidity and entry model is so mechanical and systemized that it's actually quite difficult not to see these entries. Yeah. Nice. Amazing. Every time, you know, that, that I talk with other traders, I see that the main thing which we should keep in mind is to have a system, like a systematic approach to trading and to your entry system. Not every person has it, but for example, in in your case, we just, you know, share the charts and do you say every time you follow a checklist in order to enter or? Yeah, we basically have exactly where I ran through on that video. Like if, if those that are watching want to watch that video like 10 times over, 
you basically got our strategy for free. <laughs> like that is it. Like from the four hour, wow. everything that I'm saying is our criteria. So we start from the four hour. We're looking at four hour range, high and low. We're looking at premium versus discount. We're looking at the mm -hmm. previous high or low that's been taken. Do we have follow through or do we not? And that gives us our directional bias for the day. And then on the 15 minute, we've got those criteria. We want a 15 minute range sweep or a most recent fractal sweep. And it must happen inside either of our two kill zones. And then we're placing either buy stops or sell stops with a one to three. That's it. And then we're trusting the process that we know that our strike rate typically is always a 50%. We only need a strike rate of 25% to be in yeah. profit with this strategy of one to three. And a lot of the time we're at like 67, 78% strike rates. Mm -hmm. um, and we can wait, you know, sometimes we can go one or two weeks without a trade and then we can have a week that's got like three trades in it. But yeah, of course. Yeah. On average, if we're taking like six, seven, eight percent a month on just two pairs, um, that's that's pretty good. So and passing challenges, if you go for like an FTMO that has a time limit, okay, you might not pass in the first 30 days you don't get 10 percent, but then you get a free retry and it keeps you in profit until you do and with prop firms nowadays doing no time limit challenges this is perfect yeah. for a higher time frame approach because one the no time limit reduces that anxiety that i think most people feel like that countdown of oh i've only got 21 days to uh to get 10 percent or eight percent to pass the challenge and um, with this you know you, it could take you two three months and and you can just be really chilled and bank four or five percent a month and pass the challenge and get funded. Hundred percent. That's great. And did you actually go through a process of, you know, first entering more trades and later reducing the amount of trades that you were taking? Yeah, in my personal journey. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, because there's more opportunities in the lower time frame, but more opportunities doesn't necessarily mean more profits. Mm -hmm. So I was consistent trading my lower time frame multi time frame analysis uh, system before for a good 18 to 24 months. But I found it was quite difficult to teach it to people that didn't have the access to the charts like I did. And when I sold my fitness business, obviously it gave me a lot more free time. Before that, I did find it difficult. I managed, but I found it difficult. When I became a quote unquote full-time trader after mm -hmm. selling the business, obviously that put me at a, an advantage because it meant that I was taking the trades that previously I was missing out on. And I remembered that, like I'd be in a meeting, I'd be with staff, I'd be with clients, I'd be on the road, I'd be doing things at work. And then I know that I would have missed the trade. I'd do my end of day that evening and I'd be like, okay, this happened during London. And I was in a meeting, okay, I missed that trade. And then by the time I came back from New York, there was no opportunities. And that can be quite difficult emotionally for a lot of people especially on that journey to find consistency when their analysis is correct they're not doing anything wrong but because they were at work they missed the trade and that becomes an emotional difficulty yeah. and then the next day or the next week they're rushing it because they want to they want to chase the market to win back the money that they could have won yesterday it's a real psychological battle but again with the higher time frame like that trade that I showed a minute ago, it happened over the course of three or four days. So you've got oh, plenty of time, yeah. three or four days, just to take that one trade. And even if you're kind of five, 10, 15 minutes late, because we're trading off the 15 minute, mm -hmm. you could still, like there was a trade uh, the week before last that I actually missed the initial tag because I was on a one-to-one -one call with a client. Mm -hmm. And then I came back and I placed my sell stop order afterwards, which then triggered me in. It was like, seven or eight minutes after the initial entry would have been in, right? But it shows that you're not rushing anymore. I remember the days having to copy and paste things into MT4, trading off the five second chart. And if you are one second too late, you miss the trade. Right. Unless you yeah. want a much bigger stop loss. That's crazy, um, actually. Yeah, you went from, that's crazy. You actually went from, you know, trading on like the five seconds to higher timeframes and you found your consistency with higher timeframes. As you say, do you think it's way more beneficial for people that maybe have jobs and maybe have a nine to five and, you know, are more busy in order to stay more on, in order to stay less on charts and still catch opportunities? Yeah, 100% really. And and even those that, that don't work full time, mm -hmm. I know people, we have students that actually are full time traders and they have the ability to stare at the charts 
through the whole London and New York trading sessions. Yeah. But they don't want to do that. And I don't think it's beneficial either, because if you spend too much time staring at candlesticks, it all becomes blur and you start to act more emotionally rather than theoretically. And you just start to force trades thinking, I'm bored now, so I want to be in the markets. And trading has to be boring. I've done some content on my Instagram recently about this. Trading has to be boring. So if you're yeah. finding it boring, good. You're on the right track. If it's exciting and emotional, that's not a good thing because it probably means you're bending the rules just to have fun. Right. Um, so, but yeah, like for people that work full time, trading off a higher time frame entry is definitely going to help because trading off a lower time frame might always say, don't enter from your phone. You have to be looking at a laptop or a, or a PC because you've got so much information. Mm -hmm. You've likely got to start on the daily or the four hour and then factor things like alignment with a 15 minute, your mid range. And then if you're entering off the one minute or lower, those candles move pretty fast. And there's yeah. only so much data you can fit on that small screen. Yeah. So I always say, don't trade off your phone. But actually, with the current higher time frame strategy, your four hour directional bias, it doesn't change any quicker than every four hours. Mm -hmm. And then if you're entering off the 15 minute, it takes time to play out and it doesn't move super fast. So you could actually set alerts in the morning on trading view. And when it gets to that point of liquidity on, let's say, entry model, you can place the trade from your phone quite easily. Yeah. Uh, and there's no need to manage it because it's a set and forget. There's, you're not moving your stop loss. You're not taking partials. And a lot of traders that are taking like 1 to 20, 1 to 30, 1 to 100 <laughs> trades, they're not risking one full percent. Or even if they are, they're taking heavy partials off at like 1 to 4, 1 to 5, 1 to 10. And they're leaving micro lots to like 50. Um, yeah. so why not like remove that unnecessary emotion and just have a one to three risk 1% and then just have a 50% strike rate or above and be profitable at the end of the month. Like even if you make three or 4% a month, you're still beating the bank. And then the only difference between yeah. how much money you're making is how much capital you're trading. And that comes, especially now with the amount of prop <clears throat> firms that are doing no time limit challenges. If you don't have like a decent sized chunk of money personally that you can trade, mm -hmm. which I didn't, when I first started, I accumulated that account over time. But now that you can trade a higher time frame and you can bank three or 4% a month during a challenge and still get funded after two or three months and then continuing to do that to get payouts. Say if you were 200,000 funded and you're making four to 6,000 pounds or four to $6,000 a month from your trading and you're spending probably less than 30 minutes a day trading yeah, right you've got more money than you were on a on a full-time job and you've got way more time to spend and do other things and that really is the goal really like the goal yes. isn't but the screen that you could be instant and pull three four five six percent a month and make more than you did at your job and have more free time to go and do other things that you want to do i lost it for a second can you repeat the last part please um yeah sure um <laughs> is my microphone does it cut out or no is it no, okay? no it was it was connection sorry uh sure because i believe it was like a really really important part we were talking about you know making two to three percent on a 200k account how it yeah. allows you to have more time yeah so like if you have if you were trading like a two hundred thousand from the account and you were making three four or five percent a month it doesn't sound like a lot and I think that's down to the way that social media, like Instagram has been saying, right, if you're not making 20, 30, 50% a month, then you're not a good trader. Right, but actually right. we're forgetting that the bank will only give you like 1% a month if you're looking, if you're yeah. lucky with, with cash in the bank. So if you're making two, three, 4% a month and you're trading something like a 200,000 account, you're making between four and $6,000 a month. So you're making more money from trading less 30 minutes a day if you're trading a higher time frame and you've got all this extra free time if you're you know then you're at a position where you could quit your job uh, yeah. or i know people that they're hesitant to quit their job because they, they have the ability to trade while they're at work they don't hate their job they make four five thousand pounds a month at their job and then they make another three four thousand pounds a month trading why would they need to quit you would only quit if it got in the way of your trading or you really hated it yeah so it's about perspective like you don't it's not about 
quitting the job and becoming a funded trader that has been put on a pedestal too much that is not the pinnacle it's not the end goal because once you quit your job and once you get funded you'll sit there and you'll go oh what do i do now so it's only maybe a milestone and again like i've just mentioned you don't actually need to quit your job to do it you just got to find a strategy that allows you to trade while you are working because you don't want that unnecessary pressure of having to pull money from the markets when you're mm -hmm. still trying to become consistent and profitable your trading in order to pay the bills you want something that can pay the bills while you're learning and then that extra money is just a bonus to feed into your personal account at yeah. the point where you're then consistently making three four five percent a month or more on a funded account or a decent sized personal account okay that's when you could have that conversation with yourself internally and say do i want or need this employment now now i can quit my job I'm not quitting my job to learn how to trade. I'm quitting my job because I don't need to work anymore. It's a different perspective yeah. altogether. 100%. That's a great message. I, I wanted to ask, other than trading, you were saying that you had you know, a fitness, fitness business. Are you into something else other than trading? Are you looking to start other businesses? Are you uh, investing into other things other than trading? Um, not at the moment, but... Property is something that I have as a next kind of milestone. Mm -hmm. That's something that I want to start investing money into. But while my two youngest children are very young and yeah. I have an autistic daughter as well, so it's quite difficult to have like enough time to trade, have a family, run a community yeah. and an education business, and then have another branch. I'm in no rush to do that. Like we said at the start of the call, like, I'm only 37, 19 year olds watching that will think you're old, but actually <laughs> you're still young yeah. and there's plenty of time for that. Like I sold my fitness business because I lost passion for it. I'd done that for 13 years, that one business. It was my first ever business. Mm -hmm. Most people's first business has failed. I made mine work for over 12 years and then sold for a profit. And yeah, really my spare time is split between my children Yeah. And something that's an interest of mine is just like content creation. So I really enjoy like doing pod podcasts like this. I've just opened a YouTube channel recently just because I nice. enjoy it. And I, I just enjoy like giving back. Like I've been on quite a long journey in terms of trading. So if I can give any advice out for free, I'm happy to do that. And that's also one of the reasons why I started the community as well, because the amount of questions and on a daily basis from people saying how do you take that trade can you teach me how to trade and i was like i want to help these people but i i can't do it for free because that's yeah. taking my time away from other things like my family so i was like okay well i'll, I'll start a community start off small and then that's got us to a, a 300 plus member community uh what, 10 months later where we are now amazing that's great no actually i really admire also that you know You're taking time to actually spend with your family. It's really, it's a really great message as well. It's, and I was interested also to understand about your first business because I didn't understand in the beginning that it was your first business and you made it work for 13 years, was it? Yeah, almost 13 years. Yeah, I wanted to touch on that as well. Um, how did you start? How did you actually approach that type of business? You know, way different than trading. And yeah, yeah. it was an interesting beginning. Like I was 22 and my partner who we went into business together, she was 19. Um, so we were very young. We had a six month old baby. That was our first child at the time. And I was working full time and mm -hmm. pretty much all of that money because we're living with parents and I was driving a car that was so bad that I actually gave the car away to the council okay. for scrap metal. That's how bad the car was. Like when it <laughs> rained, the roof leaked. I got wet really? driving that car. So, you know, when you need to raise capital to start a business, mm -hmm. you do everything you can, can to try and save money. Um, so, yeah, I was driving a, a clapped out car with holes in the roof. It had no mirrors and it was terrible. Living with parents, saving every single penny, working full-time, we had a baby at the same time, but we were dedicated to making this business work. Not mm. only that, but this was 2009. What happened around 2008, 2009, we were in just coming out of recession, heavy recession, which meant no banks were lending any money. Right. And they would definitely not lend any money 
to a, a 20 year old that had no track record in business. So we bought small amounts of money from family and we did everything we could through like the government schemes to get 1000 pounds from this person and 5,000 pounds from this company. And we, it was lots of hard, like over two years to gain only about 60 to 70,000 pounds of capital to start a fitness business because we had to renovate the building mm -hmm. after finding it. That was quite difficult. And then we had to pay for the fitness equipment in cash. Yeah. Them. Because again, we were so young, we had no track record. No one would finance us. So we had this large 7,000 square foot unit with like 10 pieces of fitness equipment. <laughs> it, looked, it looked like such an empty space, but we had yeah. to start somewhere. So for the first two or three years, it was just basically me. We couldn't afford any staff. We didn't take any money personally from that company for over mm -hmm. three years. So right. that transitions into trading. You know, you start any business, you don't get paid straight away. You've got right. to make that business prof profitable first because yeah. you've got to pay your overheads. We're paying rent. We're paying marketing, advertisement, insurance, accounting, stock, uh, utilities. All that comes out first. And if you've got enough clients and enough revenue to pay yourself eventually, then you can do that. You've got to factor in for your taxes too. Um, yeah. So yeah, probably fast forward three years, we started taking on staff. And then almost every year after that, I was growing a team and then I was taking a step back. So I started with being the personal trainer, the manager, the salesperson, the cleaner, everything, going everything. door to door, knocking on doors, handing out leaflets, you know, everything you possibly could to keep your expenses low, try and get business and grow it. And then I grew it to a point where I had uh, at its peak 10 staff um, mm -hmm. and then 2020, we pretty much hit a record month, March 2020, the same month that the UK announced that they were going to go into a national lockdown because of coronavirus. Oof. And yeah. then, so we went from a record high month to a record low month the next month. And it was That's like the, 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 the floor was being ripped out from underneath our mm -hmm. And we'd just invested £30,000 of our own money to renovate the business mm -hmm. in 2020. And then the next month, the paint was still wet on the on the walls when the UK Prime Minister said, you're having to close your business now. And that first lockdown was like four and a half months or something. Yeah. And no one knew when we were reopening. So that was very tough. That two years was very, very tough. I also, that was the year that my my son was born. So we had two children one was like nine uh, we had a five-year-old who was autistic who we were going through a lot of struggles with she was just recently diagnosed they had a baby and we had a business that was basically on its knees and i was doing everything i possibly could to keep it going um during uh, a lockdown when the kids were not even at school either because the schools were closed yeah, right so that was a very tough two years but we yeah. we hung on we, we, we strapped our belts as much as possible and we just kept pushing. And it got to a point where I was literally hand delivering fitness kit to our clients' homes just to keep them paying us because mm. they couldn't come to the gym. So I was like, well, shall I just give you some equipment? I'll just drive it to your house and you can have it for free. Just keep paying us because I'd still to pay the bills. Yeah. Um, but, you know, going through a, a tough time like that, and I'd say from around year eight or nine, so a couple of years before coronavirus, I'd already realized that this is not something that I wanted to do long term. Mm -hmm. The only reason I opened the gym back in 2010 was because that's the industry I started working in. Yeah. Like I was I was not academic at school. I was terrible at school. Um the only thing I was really good at was sports. I had like a, a kickboxing background. wasn't very good at football or anything like that. Um, but as soon as I started working out in the gym, I was like, I really enjoy this. I like this. Mm -hmm. And I was good at it. Um, and I'd worked at many gyms within a space of five years. And so I'd, I'd found what worked well and what people didn't like. And that's why I was like, I can do a better job than these people. So I went and opened my own gym. And like I say, we, we ran that gym, including COVID for 12 years. And on the back end of COVID around 2022, we started looking to sell the business. We had to do it obviously on below the radar because if anyone found out, it would be damaging for the business. So we couldn't tell anyone until yeah. it was done. And we managed to sell it to one of the one of the world's biggest 
fitness franchise companies actually bought it. So we, yeah, we did really well to find a buyer out of that. And it just was like a, a fork in the road moment. I was like, I can continue doing this mm -hmm. and not necessarily be happy, or I can take a risk and sell the business and focus on my trading and potentially do something else. I didn't know at the time I wanted to become a mentor. Mm -hmm. If you had asked me that back then, are you going to open a mentorship program in the Forex space? I would have said no. I've not even thought about it because I was so focused on what I needed to get done at that time. Right. But I knew that my passion and my heart wasn't in that business anymore. So, it, you know, I've been through that process where people watching this now will either run a business or they'll work a job that they just don't have any interest or any passion for. But you, you've got to understand you've got to have something to fall back on. So I was yeah. still working consistently very early in the mornings, very late in the nights with four, three or four children. <laughs> Uh, working at the weekends to become a consistently profitable trader so that I knew that once I'd sold that business that I didn't have any interest in running anymore, I had something else to bring that income in rather than going from having income to having nothing because yeah. that would have been way too risky, especially with four children. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great story, actually. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all of these insights and, and you know, your stories. Um, My pleasure. It's, yeah, it's really... It's really inspiring also you know i never met someone that started from fitness and then transitioned or learned trading in the meantime or not even that had a, another business before did, did you see any similarities between well you already told me one but did you see any other similarity between you know growing your fitness business and trying to make to make it work and make money with it and trying to make trading work yeah the, the the main similarity between, I think, running a business and trading is knowing that you've you've got to turn up mm -hmm. even if you know that you won't get paid that month. Yeah. Nice. Especially when you're first starting out on a business. Like I say, it took me three years to take a paycheck from that fitness business because mm -hmm. straight away you're paying your expenses, but you start off with zero clients, zero customers. So you've got to build that up. Yeah. Um, and that's why it's important to choose something that you're passionate about. And I was passionate about that business when I first opened it. Otherwise I wouldn't have taken the risk and, and gone and done it. And this is something I've never said before, but my family were like dead against me doing it. They were like, please don't do it. Don't open this business. It's too mm -hmm. risky. Uh, it's going to cost you too much money. Uh, what if it goes wrong? Maybe play it safe, get a job. You know, you've got a decent yeah. job right now to stick to that. Yeah. And I was like, well, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I had no one to, well, me and my partner were, were just the only people that were really driven to do it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, our family were terrified, especially my parents, because my parents are not entrepreneurs. They're very much play it safe. Money doesn't grow on trees, yeah. save for a rainy day. Whereas I'm like, no, because you save money, that's just going to like, devalue over time and I'm, when i'm 90 years old i'm going to live with regret that i didn't take a risk yeah completely different mindset to my parents uh, and of course that business could have failed in the first year miserably but i was willing to take that risk because I'd, I'd much rather take a risk and try versus play it safe all my life and live with regret when you're older because you only get one opportunity and and that can transition into trading as well like if you're really interested in trading which it really sparked interest that first seminar that I did so I thought well it's going to cost me a lot of money for this course um but if I don't do it I'll never know and just about taking that leap of faith and knowing that you only get one try at life and you don't know how long your life is going to last either so yeah. you know you've got to take that risk um yeah that's the main thing really the one thing that's different between trading and running a business is that I knew that if I personally stepped into that business and I made the phone calls and I was emailing the list and I was talking to the clients or I was knocking door to door or I was training the clients, I knew that I would put 110% into everything I did because it was my life on the line. It was my business, yeah. my reputation. And the more transactions I made, the more profit that company would make. Whereas with trading, the more chart time and the more entries you take yeah. doesn't necessarily mean the more money you'll make. That's Absolutely. the big difference between the two. So that was like, I was running a business in the day with like the business hat 
And then I had to take that hat off to become mm-hmm. a trader because it was two different mindsets. That was difficult, but that took some years to kind of get to kind of master really. Yeah, 100%. You cannot approach trading with that mentality because the more you actually work, the more the more you can actually encounter losses or you know have difficulties. It's the, le- the more you are selective, the more you can actually make money. So absolutely. Yeah, the less is more. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, man. It, w- it was great. It was great to have you here in the podcast. I'm looking forward because in either in great May, either in May or June, I might come to the UK to do some podcasts. So maybe if That'd we have awesome. time, uh, we talk and it would be great to also have one in person. But for now, yeah, it was we'll great. Thank you, for, thank you for sharing all these valuable insights and valuable lessons. And we Thanks stay for in having touch. me on. Thank you, man. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.